Welcome to Ask the Masters. This week we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, my name is Dave Penton from Fluid Dynamics Pool and Spa. And recently, Blake from Premier Pools asked me to come on with his team uh, from all across the country and just have a discussion about Infinity Edge Pools, some of the tips and tricks that I have learned over the years. And so um, we have received permission from them to utilize this. And so it was actually a really good conversation. We had some good uh, dialogue back and forth. Some really interesting questions that came in and so we hope that this benefits everybody so um, very special thanks and shout out to Premier Pools uh, for allowing us to share this with all of you uh, because I think there's some some good tidbits here and some uh, good pieces of information that uh, that went back and forth so um, thanks for tuning in and uh, enjoy the show today What I could, yeah, just to, I guess, kick it off. I mean, I kind of wanted, I know I'm plumbing is for pools is probably one of the just it's the artery of everything for a pool. You want to know, make sure everything's running right, everything's flowing correctly. What can we do to make things better? Because ultimately, there's tons of different shells, finishes, you can dress it up, dress it down. But if the plumbing's not working right, you know, the pool's not going to work right. Um, but I mean, I guess, so I'll kind of start it up, but like, personally, I kind of am really interested in, you know, the infinity edges for pools and there's different ways, you know, doing it, you can plumb it different ways you can do it, but I kind of wanted to maybe pick Dave's brain about when you're setting up an infinity edge pool, um, what are the key things you're kind of looking for as far as, um, uh, I guess, leveling processes, you know, to make sure that trough has a, a good amount of water, um, suctions, uh, how many pumps are we adding on to just a regular filter? Um, and then also, um, you know, how big that trough needs to be, you know, with water displacement. And um, I guess, um, I guess I'll let you get started, maybe just ask a couple questions after you know, kind of get through. Sure. Yeah, um, and and uh, most of this stuff um, I have uh, gained with experience, uh, but but the foundation for all of this is the uh, the hydraulics class. Um, that I took from Dave Peterson. So if you guys are really, uh, if you're wanting to take your understanding of the knowledge and the theory to the next level, um, look up the Watershape University hydraulics class. Um, it is it is hands down, um, everybody that's taken it from the guy that's been in the industry for two years to the guy that's been in the industry for 40. Um, without uh, without exception, everybody that has gone through that class has come out the other side and said, I can't believe what I didn't know. Um, and so uh, there's uh, there's two different versions. Uh, you have to take the intro class, um, which in and of itself is, um, you know, it's, it's drinking from a fire hose. Uh, and then there's the advanced class. And I'm not, I'm not here to make a, a commercial out of this. I just want to kind of set up where where I got all my information from. So with the infinity edges, um, uh, one of the things that you get after you take the advanced hydraulic classes, um, Dave Peterson has this incredible worksheet um, that comes with the class. And uh, you go in and some of the parameters that are in that worksheet are you take into account bather load, uh, you take into account how much evaporation you get locally. Um, and these are all parameters that you can, he gives you guidelines, uh, but you can tweak them based on the actual site conditions. Uh, so bather load, um, uh, precipitation, uh, like how much, uh, like a normal rainstorm here. Uh, like in California, we use either like a half an inch to a one inch for like a really big rain. So you wanna have some precipitation storage within your tank. Um, you want to have some uh, capacity for when, you know, four kids are doing a cannonball competition. Um, and then the, the biggest thing that I think gets missed a lot of times by many people is you have to have um, a minimum operating level, um, meaning that 
uh, at no time does the water level get down below, we recommend 12 inches. And so uh, at 12 inches, your autofill should be kicking on um, and, and all of that. Uh, so, um, and just to even step back a little bit further for some of you outside of, uh, you know, areas that build a lot of infinity edges, um, one of the misunderstandings that people have is the, the infinity edge basin, the water level goes up and down in there, and that's totally normal. Um, the water level, um, you know, when, when everything, when the infinity edge pump is turned off, um, the water level will come up to a certain, um, certain level in the basin. And then when the when you turn the pump on, it actually has to draw that water out of the basin uh, to raise the water level in the pool. Um, you know, basic rule of thumb is you figure about an eighth of an inch um, of capacity in the pool, uh, eighth to a quarter uh, across the entire surface area of the pool, and that's how it starts to spill over. So you'll have a big difference in the in the water level within the basin depending on when the pump is off and when it's on. Uh, and that's a big reason why skimmers in infinity edge basins don't work because you don't, you can't have a skimmer that's variable. Your skimmer doesn't slide up and down. So infinity edge basins always need to be built with just main drains on the floor. Uh, and then you wanna calculate out um, the, the uh, your, your, we call it the water in transit. That's the water that, that moves across and that takes into account bather load and everything. You wanna figure out how much water that is um, uh, and, and figure that as, your, uh, as the amount of water you need in your basin and then add 12 more inches at the bottom because uh, you never wanna have more than that. Um, you know, over the years, it seems like uh, as I've done a bunch of calculations, um, if your infinity edge basin is basically the, the length of the pool, um, the, the edges, the, the basin depths always seem to come in at about three and a half to four feet, four feet, three, somewhere in that, uh, in that range. Um, so, but you do see a lot of times that they come back, uh, that, that, that they're built way too shallow and there's not enough capacity in there. Um, the really quick rule of thumb before these uh, the spreadsheets and everything uh, kind of got um, really sophisticated and took all of this into account. Um, the, the best rule of thumb you can utilize is uh, take the surface area of the pool and we call it the two inch rule. Uh, if you figure out how many gallons of water are in two inches across the entire volume of the pool, That'll give you about the amount of gallons in your um, surge basin uh, that you need. And then, uh, and then you just have to figure out, you've got to do the math and figure out your cubic capacity, um, which will give you uh, kind of the amount, uh, how, that'll, that'll give you kind of a guideline, a starting point guideline for how big your basin needs to be. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, to quote, you know, Randy Beer, you've never met a surge tank too big. Right. You know, if, you, if you want to yeah, I mean, definitely kind of find your minimums and then, you know, see if you can really maximize what space we have. And I know in our areas and other parts of the country, you might not have that much space to work with. Um, but and then to kind of so and then to kind of go into that trough. So you're saying 12 inches of minimum space and then for keeping that water level where you want. I know uh, we've been using in the past, you know, the level ores. Um, is there any, is there any other system kind of out there other than like a level or to kind of keep that um, trough level? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely use, um, we plumb for a number of different companies here um, and uh, a number of guys just use a simple float valve. Um, you know, like you come out of an MP autofill, um, you know, we have to decide where we're going to put that. We actually don't usually put it at 12 inches. We'll put it up maybe about 16, 18 inches um, because with those, you don't have a lot of flow. Uh, and so you know that you're not going to be able to put a big volume of water. The nice thing with a leveler is you can put a three quarter inch or a one inch solenoid on there. And, uh, you know, when that thing kicks in, you can be adding a significant volume of water fairly quickly. Um, whereas with the float valves, 
you know, you're trickling water in there. It's got to go through the flapper and everything. So we generally raise those up a little bit higher um, in the basin. Uh, but I would say probably a quarter of the builders that we work with uh, just use the simple MP autofill uh, float mechanisms. And we just put a, um, you know, a half inch female adapter in the sidewall. Okay. Yeah, that's good. No, I mean, pretty much, I mean, I've always used the leveler on the basins just so that we had, you know, at least some control over kind of sure. keeping that. And one thing that I've always kind of, you know, I guess, overdoing it is with the level or especially because you have, you know, the high rod and the low rod and we try to keep them a, a good amount of separate. So we have some room to play with. And what in that, but in that instance, when you have some room to play with making sure that your troughs, if you're plastering them, the water line tile to come down, you know, to where, where's that low point going to be? Because you don't, you want that water line to stay within the tile. So, I mean, if, if doing a water line, a six inch water line tile, most likely is not going to do it in a trough, go down, you know, 18 inches or so just to give yourself some room of play. And it yeah, really the way we figure ours um, is we generally, um, we go up from the floor. So we figure out how big our basin is going to be. Um, and then I, I'm rarely setting tile less th or, or higher than 12 inches off the floor. Uh, so really in our basins, um, we're generally only 12 inch up the wall and on the bottom uh, as far as tile is concerned. And so, you know, that does tend to, you know, bump up your pricing and everything. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't want to have any time ever where we have exposed plaster um, in there. So it's, yeah, we're, we're, we're generally tiling to about 12 inches off the floor. Mm -hmm. And then as far as like suctions, is there, I mean, do, do we need to bump up uh, uh, bigger pipes or it just really depends on the volume, I guess, of how big the trough is? I mean, at what point are we, or are you kind of bumping up your, your pipe size to account for that kind of stuff? So at our, um, at our firm here, um, main drains, we take those pretty seriously uh, and just the safety aspect of it. Um, and the, the main, the, the safety factor comes in and that also I'm answering it a different way, but it applies here as well. Um, so years and years ago, when I first started really diving into hydraulics, um, I, um, I had a spa and it was the first spa that we had plumbed with four inch uh, and we did our main drains um, all with four inch and I had to get in there and uh, sand around one of the fittings, um, you know, the plaster got kind of tweaked around one of the eyeball fittings um, and I drained the spa and, you know, uh, I jumped in before it was completely empty and it was still draining down, pulled the cover off. And I was amazed. I could actually put my hand, I actually put my fist in the four inch line and it didn't draw in. And this was with a first generation Pentair and Teleflow running at full speed at full 3450 RPMs. And at that point, kind of the light bulb went off in my head like, oh my goodness, this is so much safer than anything. So no matter what size plumbing we are running for our suction line from the pump to the vessel, we always upsize at the T. Uh, and so if I have a two and a half inch line coming in, uh, we step up to four inch. Uh, and then I always run all of my main drains at four inch uh, from the T all the way out and through the floor. Um, and in infinity edges, that really helps quite a bit as well because you then have, um, you have less flow. Uh, and so, you know, I recommend 12 inch uh, for your minimum operating level. Sometimes like when we're building on a rooftop, we don't always have that ability to have that capacity. Um, and in certain situations, I'll actually do maybe a triple split, which will allow me to take that minimum operating level down to six inches or nine inches. But knowing that I've got the four inch line there um, underneath the drain covers, I don't have a whole lot of draw there. So we're not going to end up with the vortexing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of, yeah, I mean, you're, you're still doing the normal suction, but then you're really sizing it right at that T to help 
you know, collect that volume and yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it ends up being about five feet of uh, a four inch pipe and a four inch T and two four inch 90s. Yeah. So at so, the end of the day, it's a little more expensive, um, but at least out here, I know in other places in the country, it's really tough to get pipe that size. Uh, but out here, all the distribution houses have all of those parts readily available. Yeah, no, that's something, yeah, it's good to know. I mean, especially yeah, your experience where you literally put your hand in there. And I mean, but I mean, so far as uh, performance, you're still getting the same performance. It's just because you're spreading out the, the volume, you know, in, in a different, bigger, bigger area. Yeah. And the way I describe it to clients is, uh, you know, you take a garden hose and you put your thumb over the garden hose, which you've basically reduced the amount of of overall size of the, the hose itself. And that water accelerates really, really quickly. The exact same thing happens the opposite direction. Uh, so by taking that two and a half inch We're line that you've got coming from the pump and opening it to four inch, you're just significantly slowing down the amount of water that has to go in right there. And then it's accelerated back at the T, which you know there's no way for, there's no way to get back all the way that far with a hand or a finger or, or you're even hard pressed to get hair back in that far. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great, uh, yeah, it's a great kind of outlook on it. Um, just a real quick note, guys, if you're not no, muted, John, uh, John, could you mute your phone? Um, yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I'm going to talk with my guys about possibly doing that. Hey, John, would you mute your phone, please? Um, and then that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of, you know, some of the, the questions I had, I kind of wanted to open up just a couple other things. If anyone else had any, um, you know, type of plumbing questions that they were kind of, uh, had on their mind or, or wanted to, to clarify on. Then I'll jump in at once. Jonathan. Um, no, I mean, the, one of the big questions I had was the uh, autofill. So you answered that question. Uh, we use the level or as well. Um, kind of off uh, hydraulics, but uh, when you do any walls that are that are curved, curved infinity walls, uh, do you do you? I mean, obviously, they're done. Uh, one we did, we just had a hard time getting a good spill. Uh, was that because we weren't getting enough water over? Or was it because of the curvature of the of the wall, um, you know, I, I think you could probably solve it with sending more water to the pool. Um, but we just right, right on that. It was kind of like a three bend uh, curvature. It was really on one um, one bend. It just really didn't get a, a shear effect. So, what is your recommendation on on getting a good clean shear effect on a curved wall? I know on a straight wall, and Blake talks about doing these uh, shear bars or whatever you want to call them, but what do you do on, on curved? Yeah, um, it's tough to really get that uh, this spill effect uh, where you're actually launching the water off the wall. Um, I, I'm assuming that's what you're trying to you're trying to get the water to project out, kind of like a sheer descent type of an effect. Yeah, just kind of a, you know a clean a clean bead instead of a break in the bead. You know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to shear off, but a clean bead and I just I think the curvature of that wall just breaks up that bead enough to not get straight line. Yeah um, I have not had that experience um, but I know that the the tile guys that I use um, they they're really really money um, so uh, answering it a little bit further back um, I, when you're building an infinity edge, I always look to have whatever material is going on the top um, to be like if you're using a, a porcelain or something, try and find a porcelain that is a full through color material uh, because you always want to be able to have the ability to get in there and fine tune that edge. Um, you actually, you can fine tune glass. Uh, so we can get in glasses, obviously, you know, you don't have much thickness, um, but we have had instances where we've had to get in there and, and shave, uh, you know, a 30 second off the glass. And that sounds a whole lot more sophisticated than it is. Um, really, you're just, it's, it's kind of trial and error. So that would be one of the things that I would think on your, on yours is the backside of that edge, um, you know, make sure that you've got enough water going over there. 
Now, where we do have challenges is like in a square pool. Um, if we've got a square infinity edge corner where we've got an apex pointed out, um, client expectation and, and managing client expectation on those is very important because you're always going to have a dry spot <clears throat> eventually on a square corner. Um, but we have um, addressed that before where we'll actually lay everything in, get it in level, um, and then we'll come in and we'll shave down just the corners uh, so that that corner ends up being maybe a 64th lower. And, and I, we're not like actually measuring it, um, but we're, you know, we're, we're turning it on, turning it off, turning it on and turning it off. And we'll take down the corners to try to get the water to force more water right over that particular area. Um, the other thing I would look at is make sure that um, at the bottom there, um, you've got a nice clean like knife edge right there and that hasn't gotten blunted because uh, the more rounded it's going to be, the more it's going to want to just hug back on the wall, whereas if it's going down. Um, and then I think the final, the final piece that I would say is you may want to pitch those even more. Um, so the more you pitch those towards your infinity edge basin, the more the water is going to accelerate as it's going down and you're going to get more of a launching effect. So if you're trying to do a real minimal pitch there, um, you have to be pushing so much water, more water out of the pump as opposed to pitching that down a little bit more dramatically. Uh, that'll allow the water to launch a little bit better. Yeah, I think you, you know, you hit it early on and just knowing your elements, what you're working with, because, you know, where we built this is kind of up in a, a windy area. So, you know, we got to get more water flow coming over because when the wind's blowing, it's affecting how that, how that uh, spillover is acting as well. So um, other than that, what about, how do you, how do you put your lights? Do you put your lights in the catch basin uh, from the bottom facing up or do you try to keep them in the walls or what? We've done them both ways. Um, it sort of just depends on what you've got going on around. Um, you know, it, they're way easier to do in the catch basin, um, or I mean, in the in the floor pointed up. Um, in my opinion, um, a lot of times we'll have fully exposed outer walls of the catch basin, so you don't literally have the real estate to bring your light in through the side walls. Um, and so we have a lot of like hillside properties that we uh, work with. And when you put them down in the floor, uh, <clears throat> if you're on the road down below looking back up, you know, you've got the water more washing up the wall or you've got the light more washing up the wall. Um, I mean, that's kind of my preferred method of doing it, uh, but we've done it both ways and had good success. It, it also depends on kind of how, how high the, the, the difference from the basin is, um, you know, like we've got one job that, that down to the basin, we've got 10 feet of exposed infinity edge wall before you get to the basin. There's no way putting a sidewall uh, light in there is going to get enough refraction to go up the wall. So in that one, we had to go up. Uh, but, you know, if you're, if you're 24, 30 inches down, um, you know, putting them in the sidewall, you're going to get enough refraction to really um, uh, to, to spread that light out on the face of that infinity edge. And we also do quite a bit of infinity edges where there's if there's nowhere to view the the um, the basin from and you're not be able to view the property from lower or view the pool from lower. We do a lot of them with no lights at all. So, um, you know, why spend the money? You don't really notice it from the from looking across the infinity edge. Um, you know, it, it sort of ruins the effect. The whole effect of an infinity edge is you want to just look out to the sky. And then if you see this weird glow kind of coming up behind, it kind of stops your eye right there. Whereas you're supposed to be just seeing out into infinity. Gotcha. Um, Chuck, uh, you raised your hand. I got a, a question. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. I was just curious what the, do you have a recommended pitch ratio? We have a large infinity wall it's going to be about 11 feet high and it's like 24 feet um wide and i was just curious to you know see if you have a a ratio that you really like so um are you trying to have that water launch off the wall yes and it's curved so we're trying all right so here's uh, i'm going to caution you to uh, hopefully you 
have the ability to go back uh, and talk to the client about it. Yeah. Um, because the rule of thumb that I have been taught is that your basin needs to be one and a half to two times as wide as your wall is high if you're going to launch it. Otherwise, you're going to have splash out all over the place. Okay. So if you've got an 11 foot tall wall, <laughs> There's, I can't imagine you have the real estate or the budget to be building a 15 to 20 foot wide infinity edge cast basin. Um, right. You're going to have splashing all over the place. Um, so in a situation like that, we will generally pitch it backwards and we will pitch it in towards the pool and have that water hug the wall. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we're trying to get some audible qualities or you're trying to get some sort of um, something along the back wall, you can choose a like a dimensional type material, like a, uh, a stone or something that that is not perfectly flat, even with a perfectly flat material, you will get some noise just as the water trickles over the grout joints. Um, so, but if you're trying to get a little bit more sound from it, um, you know, pick something with a little bit more unevenness to it. Um, we actually just did one down at the beach and, uh, the client, um, didn't want to do any sort of a stone. Uh, and, and we didn't have, it wasn't very tall. It was only, I think it was 30 inches tall. Uh, and so we just took, um, uh, six, uh, no, I think we went uh, 12 by 24 porcelain tiles, but we laid them like, um, like shake shingles on the side of a house. Uh, right. And so we, uh, so as the water came down, it had kind of a stair step going down and it really, really created a beautiful sound. Um, you know, we, it was black material. So we set it with epoxy. So we used a lot more material to set it uh, because we needed to build out. So we didn't have voids behind those tiles. Um, but, you know, it was a very small, it was 30 feet long and, and not very tall. So right. it wasn't a significantly more amount of material, um, you know, but now that they're, this was on, on the harbor and sitting out on their dock, they could look back. Not only did they see the white water coming down, but they also had a very nice, pleasant sound to it. And, and that, that infinity edge basin was only 14 inches wide. Uh, it was very, very small and we have no splash out whatsoever. Well, great. I really appreciate it. It's not too late. We're in the um, design stages and we were just trying to figure out, you know, how, how large that basin actually needs to be. So yeah. sure. And like, appreciate like we talked it. about just a second ago too, for the, for the weir, for the top, um, yeah. see if you can find like a, a, a through color porcelain uh, so that if it's not exactly perfect, um, you know, you can get in there and grind on it and, and, you know, even a thicker one, um, you know, if you can get up into the, you know, quarter, um, you know, some of the real heavy, uh, some of even the porcelain pavers and that, that, that they're getting uh, up into the half and three quarter inch. So you can actually yeah. grind it after the fact and get it dead money and you're not grinding through your finished surface. So you, we, we could just keep tuning it. Like you were saying, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off and just have Tune it, tune yeah, it, generally tune it. it's right. one guy and they spend, yeah. you know, anywhere from a day to a day and a half just getting yeah. it all perfectly nailed. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you so much, Dave. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, material, that's kind of the next note I kind of had on my list is to kind of, yeah, really talk about material for what your Infinity Edges kind of use. I mean, I, like, there's obviously a big one is waterproofing. I mean, we can go for hours on waterproofing. I might be a, a side note on that one, but as far as material goes, I mean, yeah, I mean, like Dave was saying, using a glass or a, you know, through color, um, I've seen in the past, uh, people, uh, using stone, like, you know, like a travertine or something like that, but you just caution it's a, it's a porous material. You make sure that it's, you know, dip sealed, or it's going to be, you know, tell the client, you know, this is something that's going to have to be addressed, you know, over the years to keep, you know, sealing it because you don't want water penetrating in that porcelain ceramics glass where it's not going to get water to penetrate it in over time and break that down is, is obviously the ideal material. Um, but one thing a lot of people kind of overlook, especially when getting into this and using a lot of glass tiles is um, 
not understand. A lot of people don't understand how expansive glass tile is and, and the type of grouts and stuff to use. And kind of wanted to ask Dave, as far as your experience, um, obviously the best I always like to do, you know, the, you know, the elastomeric grout, you know, throughout, but at what point I've seen people do almost uh, joints every so often with a, a silicone or a, 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 a specific grout that does allow some movement. Um, do you have any general rule of thumb on that or just, I mean, it's always best safe just to go with a, a specific grout to do everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to quote Rick Chafee. Uh, those of you okay. that don't know, Rick, Rick runs Ask the Masters with me and, and, uh, he also runs Red Rock Contractors. Uh, probably I would say he's potentially the best pool builder in the world right now. Um, and, uh, his statement is, and, and um, hopefully we don't have any reps on here, is that glass doesn't belong in a pool. Um, and the more uh, experience that I have with glass, and we do all glass pools, I've got, you know, I've got a thousand square feet of glass going in as we speak. Um, so I do glass all the time. Um, but managing client expectation is huge. Um, because glass is finicky, it's hard to work with. And um, I made the mistake about 10 years ago uh, of telling a client that, oh yeah, you know, I've got the best guy in the world uh, and you're not gonna have any problems. And boy, uh, that ended up costing my insurance company about $50,000 uh, because, you know, six years later we had three tiles pop off and of course, we were fine. We came back in, we warranted it, we put them back on. And these were three quarter by three quarter mosaics. Um, but the client was so happy and ended up uh, using those words against me. So um, just understanding that um, glass tile will pop off. Uh, it's, it's kind of just, there, there's not a great system for installing glass where you're not gonna get some eventual failures. Um, that being said, you really need to be careful um, when you're doing glass. And we recommend that you go literally, your, your pool shell is, you know, you've got your shotcrete shell. From the moment you leave that pool shell, as far as your buildups, you really should be working with one manufacturer's products, whether it's Laticrete or, um, uh, Laticrete's the one we use quite a bit. Um, the Miracote is, is an interesting one. Um, they're working on a full system all the way through grout. Uh, they kind of have all the substrate and, and that worked out, but they're working on building the whole thing. Um, Lidocol is a really good one. Lidocol does not have floats though, um, uh, but they have, so you want to have your, um, you know, even your floats, that's a little bit from, from an on the record, um, we like to go with the Laticrete 3701 uh, to build our mortar bed out. Uh, and then on top of that, we will use uh, their membrane system, um, uh, either the uh, Hydroban or the Hydroban cementitious. Um, going more and more with the cementitious because there's so few all tile pools. Um, so then you're putting your, your cementitious on and then you're using either, um, you know, their, their glass tile adhesive or their uh, platinum 254 um, as your thin set. And then they've got a number of different grout choices. Um, the, one, the one area where we have been transitioning for the last probably three or four years um, is that on infinity edges, we're really moving to a, uh, an all epoxy system um, where we're not even using 254 anymore. Um, so we're going with a lat epoxy 300 um, and then the Spectralock Pro epoxy grout. Uh, the benefits to that are the epoxy is much more, um, it bites and it, it holds the glass tile a little bit more. Um, you really wanna talk to some of the manufacturers, push back on that though. Um, I think Oceanside is backing off of their, um, uh, they used to say that you can't use epoxy on any of theirs. Um, they've started to back off of that, uh, but you really should be talking to the manufacturers of the tile, especially in an infinity edge situation and just making sure that 
that you're following their protocols. Um, uh, and and I, I, if you've heard any of my webinars or anything, I always say, don't be scared of your reps. Get to know your reps because, um, you know, like I know the Ladder Creek rep out here and I don't, um, they're not your enemy uh, and they don't want to be pulled into a lawsuit uh, because you guys did something, you know, you made a mistake or something. And so they're there to actually support you. Uh, and so rely on them, you know, and take the, take the time to build those relationships. And then you can just shoot an email uh, back and forth and say, Hey, we're thinking of this with this grout and this system. And they'll tell you, Hey, you know, yes or no. Um, so I can't stress that uh, importantly enough. Um, and a, I, I think I kind of veered off of your no, topic. That was, I mean, because a lot of a lot of tile or manufacturers, a lot, you know, a lot of these guys, they have a pretty good diagram that you know that they yeah. could even shoot you. And I just kind of give to my guys in the field, and it's just a a plan that just shows very rudimentary, you know, shot creek gunite or whatever vessel it is. And then the types of layers, the sandwich that goes in there. And, you know, like, you know, Dave's saying is having a one company that has all those materials makes it easier because when things happen, it's, you know, as Dave knows, it's a finger pointing game. Well, all that failed because of that, you know, mortar or that thin set or that wire paper, because it's not as simple as, you know, licking it and sticking it. There's a lot of things that go in there, especially when you're doing infinity edges. Mm -hmm.